So my name is Sarah Milligan. I'm with the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program at the OSU Library. Today's date is May 28, 2016. Um, I am here talking with Charles LeClaire. We're at the Shilako Indian School reunion at the Shilako campus, um, and we're doing interviews with uh, Shilako military veterans. That's as formal as it gets. Um, okay, so I want to start first with just a little bit of background about you. Um, where are you from? Who are your parents? Did you have siblings? All that good stuff. Well, I was born in uh, Marlin, Oklahoma, which is uh, uh, south of Ponca City. Uh, actually, it, it's south. In, uh, the farm that we lived on was my uh, father's Ponca allotment. It was 80 acres of farmland that, by token of being a Ponca, he had uh, property allotted to him. Uh, he died when I was four years old. Um, I was born at home at, in Marlin, Oklahoma. Actually, it was on a rural route east of Marlin. So, uh, my mother, my father was a Ponca and Potawatomi Indian, and my mother was a Kaw and Potawatomi. So we had more Potawatomi blood than any other. So we were always told we were Potawatomis. Uh, I went to grade school a half a mile from my uh, farm, which was actually, it bordered the, the little one-room schoolhouse mm -hmm. where a teacher taught nine grades and each each grade was in a row. Oh. And when, and, and when I got out of uh, Turney School, there were only two ninth graders, so we, we occupied the ninth grade row. Uh, that's that's where I went to school through nine grades, mm -hmm. and um, I that other gentleman was Bryce Beck. Uh, we were probably the uh, probably the fifth of five. Indian families that lived in that community. Mm -hmm. uh, we went to school with them and uh, mostly uh, German families mainly were the farmers in our community. Um, Bryce Beck turned out to be a Navy pilot and he got out of the Navy and he started working for Lockheed. Well, I was, I went to school there and in the attorney school with, with Bryce. We were good friends and uh, I went, I, I went to Sulaco, I went to Oklahoma Baptist University. Um, I went to Southwestern Seminary in Fort Worth, Texas. I became a preacher uh, while Bryce was uh, working for Lockheed. Uh, leaving ahead yeah. a few years, uh, I was working for Lockheed by token of the fact that I was working at the Space Center, the prime contractor for the space shuttle. And I worked for Lockheed after uh, uh, retiring from the Army, and retiring from civil service, mm -hmm. retiring from a lot of places. Yes. And um, so I was working for Lockheed at Space Center. Bryce was working for Lockheed at uh, Sunnyvale, California, which was our uh, main, main uh, company. Mm -hmm. Lockheed is a big corporation, and um, Sunnyvale is more more or less its headquarters. Mm -hmm. 
Well, we had a reunion while I was working at Lockheed and Bryce was still working, working at Lockheed out in California. Uh, we had invited a whole lot of uh, friends and families to come to our family reunion and Mrs. Beck was there, Bryce's mother. And I went up to her and I said, uh, Mrs. Beck, did you know that 100% of Turney School's ninth grade class works for Lockheed? And she said, yes. I, and I said, both of us. <laughs> and we, we, got, we got a lot of fun out of that. But that's what happened. Uh, I went I went to uh, Sulaco Indian School, where, where we are right now, and... Uh, what year did you go there? I started in Sulaco in 1944, and I graduated in 1948. And while I was here, uh, I was on the boxing team. It, that's really not saying a whole lot about our abilities, because we didn't have any real big boys but because Oklahoma is a football state and always has been and the towns where these boys, the big boys came from knew about the football players who were in it and they influenced them to go to school at home and guess what, we got the little guys so we had football but I remember a score when we went to uh, Ponca City because by the fact that we, we were that big a school, we had to compete with that school. We, but we didn't have the material that those schools had because they had them. Mm -hmm. And uh, that score was 45 to nothing. I'll, I'll never forget that one. We, we won a few games, but hardly any. And boxing was our our sport because you had to be matched up side by side, mm -hmm. and uh, we uh, we entered most of the tournaments. In those days, there was a lot of boxing going on. Uh, almost all of the major newspapers, like the Tulsa World and and the Oklahoman, sponsored teams. Uh, since we are near near uh, Kansas, uh, we competed with Haskell Institute, and in those days there were a lot of Indian schools in Oklahoma. About eight or nine were active, and they all had boxing teams. In fact, there was a all Indian tournament in Muskogee every year. We always had a national champion out of this school, this the little school here. One year we had two national champions. Uh, boxing certainly was our sport. Mm -hmm. um, and also we had a company C of the 45th division mostly Indian. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we went to Fort Sill for the annual encampments. And uh, on the subject of boxing, my good friend, Fred Underwood, who graduated with me in 1948, he was a terrific boxer. And uh, but we were friends, and we were both in the National Guard, and we went to Fort Sill that year, 1947, and Fred said, uh, when we got to Fort Sill, he said, come with me. Well, we walked wherever we went. We walked two, two or three miles, it seemed like, on Fort Sill. And we came up on a little rise, and then abruptly you looked down, and there were seats. This, this they called the artillery bowl. Uh, it was built for 
for nothing more than boxing. And it had a ring in the center, mm -hmm. but it had no roof on it. Um, we walked up to the ring. I knew by then what he wanted us to do. And uh, there were trophies sitting on the table next to the ring. And uh, he said, let's enter this tournament. And there were weight, they were, they were by weights on the, on the trophies. And I said, well, I don't want to fight you. And he said, well, you enter 118 and I'll enter, enter 126. He, he, he was, he said, I'll fight, I would work out really hard and lose some weight because it was, uh, it was get the next week, we had a two week encampment. And, uh, and I wasn't quite, I didn't weigh quite 118, but I competed in 118. And uh, that's called Bantamweight. And uh, we entered that tournament and he persuaded other people from this boxing school to enter in the tournament. We won the team trophy. He won the championship of 126 pounds, and I won the championship of 118 pounds. All right. And uh, I want to tell you another story about Fred Underwood. Okay. Now, was this with a company C went down there as a yes, company and did that? Yes, it was that? company yeah. C. And uh, when 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 we would uh, live in a dormitory, when we'd go to bed, they'd have a a, a room check. At 9.30 you had to be in your room and uh, at 10 o'clock they turned the lights out. And then at 12 o'clock you had to be in your bed. You had to be in your bed. Well, there's a lot you can do between 9.30 and 12 o'clock. Uh, I knew one thing about teenage boys. They're interested in two things. They're interested in girls and food, nothing else. So by, by the time six o'clock had passed, at 9.30 we were hungry again and uh, there was an all-night restaurant on the state line. It was a truck stop. The building is still there on the old highway. And there was a guy that took care of the, just one guy, that took care of the restaurant and filling up with gas, and that actually they even checked her oil in those days. And he had a what used to be white rag that hung around his belt and he'd check her oil and wipe the stick off. Give you your oil, fill your tank with gas. If you wanted a hamburger, he went inside and wiped his hands on that rag and he took the hamburger and stuck it on the grill. And uh, so Fred and I collected enough money from our hungry team, uh, uh, classmates and we'd charge them a little bit. So when we got up there, we'd, we'd eat our hamburgers while the guy was frying the ones that we'd take back. So Fred and I dated sisters. Uh, I, I won't mention their names because I didn't marry the one that I dated, but uh, Fred did. And uh, that's all we talked. We had our hamburgers. Now we talked about our girls. So we're coming back. Being boxers, we, we could run a little bit. If we were late, we'd make it up. So we're kind of trotting down the highway on a night that had no light anywhere. In those days, you didn't have very much light out yonder in the, in the country 
And uh, I ran down the middle of the highway, every once in a while I could see something there. Fred ran over here on the shoulder, and we we're huffing and puffing. We have bags of hamburgers under each arm, four bags, and all of a sudden, bang! I heard I heard the bang, like a like a metal sign, and then I heard the rolling of hamburgers. In those days, they 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 wrapped hamburgers in wax paper. And you can imagine how many have, I mean, probably 24 or five hamburgers rolling on the, on the uh, pavement. And Fred, I said, Fred, you all right? And he didn't answer. And uh, I, when I realized that he had knocked himself out, he, did, he had never, ever lost a fight. And he, he ran into a, a metal sign that had an iron post in it, and it hit him right in the nose, and down he went. And I'll swear, here's what he said when he woke up. Uh, I'm, I'm laying there laughing. Yeah, a truck could have run over me. I would still been laughing. And when Fred came to, he, here's what he said, I swear. He said, what round did he get me in? <laughs> and and he even though he had been knocked out, he still had his sense of humor. And uh, I, I've told that story with Fred present, and Fred would always say, "I don't remember that." <laughs> and and I I would say to him, "Yeah, that's just proof that it knocked you out." Uh, so did you pick the hamburgers up and take them? I, 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 I oh, you're knew you were going to ask that. I knew you were going to ask that. Uh, what, we, what he did, or what we did, we picked them up. And there's always sand on the highway. And we brushed the sand off. And when we got back to Chilaco, we, we, we just, you know, gave them their hamburger and didn't say a word. Nobody complained. So, uh, that, uh, Remind me not to ask you to get me lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, as I've said, lunch and girls uh, was on our minds. One time, when we were going to Fort Sill for an encampment, it was it was a year that we had that boxing championship down there. Forty seven. That's a long time ago. And uh, as we were going, as we got on the train, we were the first company to get on the train. And we, we stopped in Ponca City, and they got on the train, and so forth, uh, right down the middle of Oklahoma. Uh, somewhere after we, we, we left Oklahoma City, they served us uh, sack lunches. Now, these were not just Chilaco people. These were, this was uh, the 45th Division feeding its troops. And uh, there were cheese sandwiches in there, and it was August, or you know, not, not there was no cooling on those on that train, and probably no cooling where they stored those sack lunches. Well, we ate our sandwiches, no problem. All of a sudden, the train stopped. And guys got off, they started getting off the train in front of us and behind us. Not, not a, our car was Company C. The others were Ponca City and Guthrie and other towns. And the guys were all thrown up. And guess what? None of the Indian boys were doing it. <laughs> and, and, and everybody said, well, what, how, how do you explain that? Well, these Indian boys, they know what, their, their stomachs are conditioned to bad food. <laughs> that's what we said. Tougher, uh, tougher training. <laughs> yeah. 
that was a that was one of my favorite stories of uh, of being a being a company C member. Oh yeah. Uh, well, actually, tell me a little bit more about um, Company C when you were in Chilaco. I, I know that Company C was was stationed here on campus yes. since the twenties. Um, at what point did you get involved with them? Well. Um, there was a first sergeant, a, the a first sergeant, I guess you know what a first sergeant is. Yeah, you can. He's a, he's a top kick. He, he is a top sergeant in your outfit, in a company. He, a company is four platoons of men, and, um, I don't think, I don't know, I didn't say that right. Okay. Um, a, a platoon is four squads of men, and then there are a number of platoons in a company. But uh, he was he was the top sergeant in the company, and usually a company uh, is uh, commanded by a captain. And you ha and the platoons are commanded by a first lieutenant. Well, no first lieutenant ever gets anywhere if he doesn't not have a, a, a proper first sergeant. The first sergeant makes officers, uh, even though they earned their bars somewhere else. Uh, any wise officer will consult his first sergeant about how to run run men. Our sergeant became uh, Courtney. Can't remember his first name. But he became our company commander. And uh, at that time, the 45th Division uh, was running a contest of recruiting. Now, the 45th Division was an all National Guard comp uh, division. And um, so every company in Oklahoma was having a contest to recruit uh, new members. Courtney was a, a terrific leader. And uh, We, we recruited so many people that he became with the winner in Oklahoma. And he got to shake the president's hand for recruiting most guys at Schlockel. And the reason that he didn't tell the president was that I and others were under 17 years of age. I was 15, and all my 15-year-old friends, I enlisted them, and guess what I earned? I earned $10 for, for being the top recruiter in our company. And uh, Did you just lie about your ages? We, we, uh, when, when they, we, we didn't tell them by, by our, our voice. We, they hand us a piece of paper and we, we filled out some particulars and nobody said a word and uh, all those young kids became um, eligible to go to war and some of them did. Some of them didn't come home from Korea. Yeah. Um, that, that was part of the uh, uh, story of being in the company C. Um, how do you feel, like looking back on that, how do you feel about that strategy of recruit, recruiting underage? I don't, I, uh, I'm, I'm not very politi politically correct. Yeah. I don't really care uh, whether somebody uh, violates a, a small rule or not. Um, if they make good soldiers, they make good soldiers. Most, 
a lot, I should say. I, I was 10 years old when uh, World War II broke out, so I was very aware. I was, I was a very observant young kid. A lot of things, I, I, I felt real deeply about. And um, war was one of them. I came up, I grew up thinking war was part of life. And if you want to uh, let your nation survive, uh, you got to send people who are willing to go. And if you're willing to go at 15 and they'll take you, go. And uh, that, that's the way I feel about that. Uh, uh, Bryce Beck and this guy, uh, we made model airplanes for the DAR flight school in Ponca City that was training British flyers to be pilots and shoot down German airplanes. So when you all were in your we one, were, one room We were in house. grade school. Yeah. And um, the, the school would give us a a model airplane if we built one just like it and let them have it. And they hung those things in their flight school for uh, uh, identific identification purposes. A real airplane. And they gave us one in return. Well, we, we made about maybe a hundred airplanes over a period of time. And uh, his mother hung them in what I I used to I would call it when I lived in Florida it looked like a Florida room to me and uh, she she hanged them hung them in that uh, sunroom we had a lot of uh, spare wood balsa wood and paper that. We, we, put, we pasted over them, over the frames. And we designed a delta wing airplane with two engines on it. Those engines, of course, were powered by rubber bands. And it flew. That was long before there was such a thing as a delta, air, a delta wing air force, uh, uh, airplane. That's how serious we were about airplanes. Bryce became, as I said, a Navy pilot. Mm -hmm. my, my ambition was the aeronautical engineer. And uh, we looked at life pretty serious back then. Uh, I remember one time, um, my father died when I was four years old, and my mother, how she raised us, I'll never know. But we didn't even have a car. And she, she was in Ponca City. My brother and I were at home alone. My sister, other sisters had probably graduated from Chilocco and were somewhere else. And my brother was two years younger, and there were flights of airplanes flying around all the time. And I saw, must have been a full squadron of them coming from the south and headed north, west of us. And you know what? It scared me to death. I'd been, the, the way we got the news was the Punk City News. Mm -hmm. And in, in, in Punk City on Grand Avenue, there used to be, uh, I think it was, was a uh, bookstore or something like that. But they would put the latest war pictures 
on on there. Well, the worse they looked, the better people saw them. And when I'd go into town, I'd have a look at those pictures. And uh, it it made you think seriously. You, you had you had emotions about your brother. My my brother was a, a pilot. And you had emotions about people going over there and getting shot at. Mm -hmm. Probably worse than reality was, was your imagination at least. But I think we, I think we grew up too fast. Uh, and, uh, but we were, uh, it, for one thing, it made you do, do things like schoolwork with a, a sense of seriousness. Mm -hmm. And it caught up with me when I went to college. When I went to college, I had fun. I just had all kinds of fun. I barely graduated. <laughs> because I had, I had not been, I had not ex experienced having fun with other people. Yeah. Not I, even while you were at Shalako? Uh, I was a staff sergeant when I was 17 years old. Uh, that's incredible. When when I went to a welding school in just south of Atlanta, Georgia, they called me Babyface, and I was Babyface. They didn't know I was just 17, <laughs> and here I was with. I didn't have to pull duty because I, I outranked everybody else. And uh, Staff Sergeant is, a, is a, I forgot what they call them. The, 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 you, you have, if you have three stripes, you're a buck sergeant. If you have a rock underneath, you're a Staff Sergeant. They're, they're, they are very, uh, the army protects them from a lot of duty, and that's one of them. What I thought I want to say. Okay. Uh, you're exempt from bad duty. Uh, bad duty meaning KP, and you know the guard. You, uh, uh, being a being a guard, you're exempt for that from that kind of stuff. And to clean up details. Nah, staff sergeant don't do that. And that I was a staff sergeant. Uh, it's incredible, even after I think about it. You know, uh, when I went to when I went into the Air Force, I went in as a buck private, and uh, uh, the first day on the parade field, he uh, they called the drill sergeant the uh, uh, what they call it. Uh, uh, it was something about flight. Mm -hmm. flight. It was a flight instead of a instead of platoon. Uh -huh. And uh, he said, uh, "Anybody who has any previous service, step forward." Well, I stepped forward, and three other guys stepped forward. And he knew us by name already. And uh, no, there were four others, four others. And immediately he he designated one of them as squad leader. The other and the other three as squad leaders. And then he said, Emerald Le Leclerc, step forward. I, I would I would I was lined up with them. We all stepped forward, and I was be, I was one step behind him. And so he said, "Step forward." I stepped forward. He says, "From now on, anything Airman Leclerc tells you is like I'm telling you." So I became the basic assistant because I had had previous service. Mm -hmm. In his book, I had previous service. Yeah. In fact, I knew more about some of it than he did. 
because he was he was he had been in the Air Force long enough to get rank and uh, but that's that's what I did in the Air Force uh, when I when I joined the Air Force I wanted to become a pilot like my brother did he used to send me th things from air cadets man I I had my eyes I, I building airplanes mm -hmm. I had my eyes on flying an airplane. So is that why you joined the? So if I understand, you joined the Air Force after you left Shilako, right? Did Precisely. You, you enlisted specifically yes. in the Air Force, yeah. My mother had to sign for me because I was seventeen. You 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 had to be eighteen. Mm -hmm. Did she do that easily? Yes. She had seen her old son go to World War II. Mm -hmm. He never got overseas, but he ferried planes to England and back. He could he was in he was in the war zone. Well, he wrote letters to me and told me things that I never told anyone else. And uh, I just wanted to be a pilot. He got out of the service and he became a crop duster. <laughs> Anyhow, about the pilot thing. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, I went in when I was 17, and at that time, the Air Force, in order to get you, they'd give you a Barksdale letter. That's magic of that day. It was magic. If you had a Barksdale letter and you were an airman in the Air Force, everybody else wanted it. What did it do? The Barksdale letter ensured that after enlistment in the Air Force and completion of basic training, you would sure enough go to the school that you chose before you joined. Guess what I chose? I wanted to, to know a little bit about the ground communication to pilots. What the pilot hears on the ground before he gets down there or before he goes up. That's logical, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That's 17 year old thinking. I, I don't think that soundly now. <laughs> I chose to go to uh, fly a uh, uh, control tower operation. They call it ground control now, I believe. But you were the voice of the ground to the pilot, and you knew what he had to say. You knew what you're supposed to say. I had a flight, I had a Barksdale letter that ensured that I would go to that school. There was another reason why, why I couldn't go to air cadets because I was 17 mm -hmm. and I would be eligible to go to air cadets when I was 20 and a half. Well I had a few years. I'd spend them in the Air Force getting used to being in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. That's pretty good, that's pretty mature thing. That's good logic, yeah. And uh, well when I got out of basic training at uh, Shepherd Field at uh, Wichita Falls, Texas, south of Lawton. Mm -hmm. We all went to the bulletin board to see what school I was going, where I was going. There were three flights, 98, 99, and 100. 100 was my flight. I looked on the flight 100 assignments one of them said South Pacific, another one, none of them said schools. Another one said, uh, I don't know where that one got, but the one that included me said Alaska. And you, you pick up your orders by going to the orderly room. 
so I went to the order room and I picked up my orders. I knew what they were going to say. And I, before I left the order, the order room is the, is the official office of the lowest unit in the service. It, it's home to all your paperwork. And uh, they have everything about you that they know. And that is where your commanding officer sits. He's usually a captain. Most of them are for lieutenants. But I requested to see the captain. And uh, I went in and saluted him smartly. And uh, what's your problem? And I said, you, did you notice that he said, what's your problem? Because everybody has a problem or they don't come see me, you know. <laughs> that That's the only reason you come to see somebody. What's your problem? So uh, I said, I had a Barksdale letter, sir. Yeah, I know about that. I know about that. I sure, I wish I could help you. And he, he went, he would sound very sympathetic. And he said, ah, you know, Korea is coming up. Somebody's somebody it making noise over there and Paul Brass are getting nervous and uh, they're they're asking us to send them all the manpower they can get. So it's amazing. This was in nineteen uh, uh, forty nine. Oh, Korea occurred in June nineteen fifty. They were already worried about Korea. The military was. And um, so uh, he explained that to me. And there wasn't nothing he could do, therefore nothing anybody could do. Did you feel that was true? I didn't know what I felt. I, I felt, I, I even, if if somebody asked me about my time in those days, I'd say, yeah, the Air Force made a bad promise to me, you know. Uh, I, I, I was still disappointed. Uh, I didn't get to learn how to fly, basically, because of that. Yeah. And uh, I, I was assigned to duty in Alaska. Uh, there's there's a, a report in, in a in a company that is uh, it, it is it I don't know whether they still require it or not but it's a basic report it's a daily report they call it the morning report on the morning of that date you are logging in every personnel activity that happened the last 24 hours, meaning new assignments, people coming in, people leaving, people going on leave, people dying, anything that happened to people goes on the morning report. It'd be surprised how long that can get. It looked like a roll of toilet paper. In those days, it had about five carbons on it. It was designed for the morning report. I'd produce a morning report that you would roll up to send to group headquarters. That's above us. Mm -hmm. Then they send it to wing, which is above them. And wing headquarters sends it to Washington that same day. They radio In those days, they radioed it. Today, the computer, it gets it in five minutes from where you, time you produce it, I guess. But that was uh, what I was doing, and that's the reason I wear glasses. Oh. We had a, uh, you, you would be surprised of how uh, <laughs> primitive our living quarters were. We had a little 60 watt light bulb in 
for a room about as big as this. And that's where my office was. There were desks all over. This was in Alaska? This was in Alaska. And uh, in no time, my eyesight went from 2020 to wearing glasses. That meant, guess what? I couldn't go to cadets. I couldn't go to air cadets. I had to have uncorrected vision. That's what they said. It's amazing that pilots fly all the time with glasses on, but they didn't have glasses when they went to flight school. Uh, you know how I found out that I couldn't see? I was bunking with a, a good friend. He was, he had he was a corporal and I was a private. He had been there a little while. So he had rank on me, so he took the bottom bunk and I took the upper bunk. Mm -hmm. And we had other friends who would come around. And one day, a friend who wore glasses laid his glasses on my bunk. And we would lean on the bunk like that. And he put them he was on that side of the bunk, and I was on this side, and I reached over and put his glasses on. And I looked around. And down there about, it's a big barracks. It was not wood. It was uh, uh, stone, I mean uh, cement and iron. You know, it was, a, it's there today. I've seen it. I went to back to Alaska. I saw it. And, uh, down there in the corner was what I considered just another airman. I had, I had never seen his rank before. When I put on the glasses, I looked down there and I saw his, his uh, extra ha uniforms hanging. There was no closet. They just were hanging on a rack. He's a staff sergeant. I could, I could see with these glasses the stripes that I couldn't see before. Did you I, di I didn't tell anybody right then. Uh, I was so disappointed. And I was afraid to go to the eye doctor. I knew they I knew they'd tell me I needed glasses. Mm -hmm. So I, I, you know what, I had been m making do with the sight that I had and I didn't even know I was going blind, you know. But what bothered me most was I was never going to fly. And uh, I, it, it's hard to say right now. Yeah. Well, guess what? I got glasses, and there was a, a guy who was almost an alcoholic, we'd call him today, great friend though and he heard about he heard me say something about flying he said Turner why don't you come with me I, I, I'm I'm in a flight club a flying club Nick flying club k-n-i-c-k -K. Nick Nick River it, it, it's where that vice presidential candidate, she lives close to it. Uh. And uh, so I started going, I joined the flight club. You know what, it only cost a hundred dollars down to join the flight club. And then you had to pay $25 a month. And then you had to leave the airplane wet, that is, full of gas. If you ever used it, you had to leave it with gas. So did they teach you how to fly then? Oh, I'm sorry. They had, they had flight instructors all over Merrill Field. 
I've seen it since then. Mm -hmm. Merrill Field at the time that I was taking lessons there was the busiest airport in the world. Alaska is full of airplanes and Merrill Field is, in, is, is located in the largest city of Alaska. So therefore, all the airplanes operate in, into Merrill Field. And I learned how to fly uh, uh, even though I didn't go to air cadets. And I flew as long as I could afford it. That's, uh, I, I get a little emotional about this because I did, did not get done what I wanted to do. I wanted to fly for the Air Force. Mm -hmm. But uh, after I learned how to fly, you know what I told my brother? I said, it ain't such a big deal learning how to fly, I did it myself. <laughs> What do you think about that? <laughs> yeah, what, what do you think of that? I learned how to do it myself. Good. You made a big deal about it. <laughs> I've got a picture of downtown, or, or, or yeah, well, it's downtown, of Anchorage, Alaska. From, I was flying a six to five horsepower uh, Taylor craft. It's just, it's just about. Uh, 15 miles fast, uh, miles an hour faster than a Piper Cub. It, it's, a, it's in a Piper Cub class, but it's, it's, it's faster. And it has bigger wings, meaning that when you, when you, when you try to land it, in a, in a pilot's lingo, it floats. You almost have to push it down, because the wings are so big. They, Airplane wants to keep flying, and uh, you have to make it fly, make it come down, mm -hmm. and that that's the difference in it than the Piper Cub. But the Piper Cub, Cub I I believe the Piper Cub, I, I I honestly believe the Piper Cub is probably the best airplane. But uh, the reason the Piper Cub is so uh, uh, universally known is that uh, the Army used the Piper Cubs in all of their flight schools. So more pilots were of World War II era were trained in Piper Cubs than any other airplane. And uh, I, I, I worked at the Space Center because of my interest in things that fly. And that's basically the reason I went there. Mm -hmm. I knew I'd get to see, I was going to be up close to see those mm -hmm. uh, shuttles go up. I'm I'm about to run out of what I'm what I'm talking about. No, you're doing. I'm sorry. I was I was trying to get a handle on um, your sheet is pretty detailed that you gave yeah, us your bio okay. sheet. Um, so I was wanted to make sure I understood where where all you went but um so you were in Alaska that was your first for your first assignment it yes. like was in Alaska mm -hmm. um and how long were you there I was in Alaska 32 months oh in, in the uh at Almendorf okay and when I enlisted in the Air Force I enlisted for three years after June, I think it was June of 1950, um, Korea occurred, and President Truman extended all three-year enlistments to uh, uh, four years. There was a little clause, a little condition after that. Um, and it really, well, all it meant was four years or uh, at the option of the commander. Okay. If you didn't serve four, you could, he could, he could let you go if it wasn't essential that you.
go do another year. Uh, so I got out in uh, four years and ten, I mean three years and ten months or something like that. Okay, and that was your your first foray? <laughs> yeah, well that, that was my, uh, Company C was preliminary, I guess you'd say, and uh, uh, like I told them out there this morning, I said, uh, you know, Boy Scouts, come yeah. to see Air Force, retired Army. Uh, it, uh, I, I know other service members are, are going to hear this or see this, but the way I felt at the time, Air Force was almost like National Guard. You know, I, I got more out of the National Guard than I ever got out of the Air Force. And when I went in the Army, I was in the real Army. Mm -hmm. I, I felt I was in the real military when I went in the Army. Um, what do you think the difference was between what you got out of the National Guard versus what you got out of the Air Force? Like, why was that more? Uh, that's, a, that's a powerfully good question. Um, uh, part of it is uh, a little maturity on my part to determine the difference. I might have been too young in the National Guard or the Air Force to rightly uh, assess and determine what what was worth what it was worth to me. Uh, and he, this in one way the Air Force left the uh, the latest, the longest and deepest change in me because during my, I haven't said anything that on any of the materials that I've submitted to you, but while I was taking flying lessons in the Air Force in Elmendorf, Alaska, Anchorage, I was going to church and the church made a greater influence on me, being in the Air Force, uh, than any church I've ever been in since then. This church was established by some military people. And it was more church than I'd ever seen. Mm -hmm. In my when I was when I was at Chilaco here, They, they sent workers and missionaries of all the denominations. We had services here. Well, I, I became a member of the First Baptist Church of uh, Newkirk because that was the closest church, although they had the services out here. So when I went in the Air Force, this young man that, uh, Glenn Smith, the guy that both we bunked with, he says, why don't you come to church with me? And I said, where do you go? He said, First Baptist. I said, I didn't know there's a church here. So, I joined a group of airmen and soldiers. Uh, Elmendorf and Fort Richardson are on the same land. So there were GIs from the Air Force and the Army. That church was formed by GIs. And they still went there, generations of them. At the time I went there with Glenn Smith, Glenn Smith was going to go to college and go to seminary and pastor a church when he got out of service. Well, I didn't have that in mind. I told him that I wanted to be an aeronautical engineer, but, and I told you what I told him. Mm -hmm. Well, I kept going to church there. And on Sunday afternoon, I'd go out and fly. That, I, I, was, I enjoyed that period. Uh, 
I I had always lived away from home. I wasn't homesick, but I had I I got I I I learned to type better. I became a clerk typist. I, I learned photography on the Air Force grounds. They had photography where you could go and you'd take courses in it. And you could make your own picture, develop your picture. I did I did all that. You could learn Morse Morse code. I learned that. Mm -hmm. I did all the things I could do that that that, that was available to me. One t uh, uh, I don't know whether this is pertinent or not, but I was flying this airplane out on Sunday. It was a, it was a winter day. Well, in the winter we put the wheels on skis, and uh, so I I came out and cranked the airplane up and took off all by myself. Mm -hmm. And I was flying over a lake they call Spinard, Spinard Lake. And I noticed that it, it's about 15 or 20 miles at that time out of the city limits of Anchorage. And I saw what looked like to me a, a, a channel between Spinard Lake and another lake. And they built the International Airport since I left over here. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I thought that that looked like a runway to me, this, this channel. So I went down low and I thought, well, no, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, so it's man-made. And I went down and of course in wintertime it's frozen all over. The lake and any water is frozen. So I went down low to see if there was any uh, obstacles like st uh, big pieces of wood or anything frozen into the ice that would be dangerous. I didn't see anything. So I swung around and got the wind and then landed down there. And I taxied up to a uh, a group of trees and all of a sudden I saw all of these uh, log homes, log buildings and I thought well how can this a summer camp of some kind and I said I didn't know, I said to myself I, did, I didn't know if this was here and uh, I'm gonna go look at it so I taxied on up there I shut off the engines just like I landed we didn't have radios in those in, in those. Nobody, the 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 CAA didn't require those type planes to have radios. You you communicated by wings. If like if let's say you're going to take off, well you turn your airplane at a 45 degree angle toward the uh, tower so that you can have line of sight. And he gives you a blinking yellow light. That means don't move. And then, he, or he'll give you a red light, means the same thing. But a blinking red light means to get ready to do something. And then he gives you a green light and you take off. How's it gonna land? Same way, you come in at a 45 degree angle. This, this, Here's a runway, and here's a flight, and here's a flight pattern. This is the flight pattern, and you come back in here. So you loop around like a U-turn, and yeah, well, yeah, well, it's, it, it's uh, uh, airplanes make it a U-turn, mm -hmm. but it's actually you come in here at this, you come in here at approximately where you want where you want to land par parallel, mm -hmm. and you come around here. Right here, you ought to be about 400 feet. Right here, you're about 800. Right here, you're four. Down here, you're two. And you're coming on the downwind lake. 
So that's, I did. I, I flew into that. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I shut the engine off. And I found out that it, sure enough, was a summer camp that you could rent. You could come out there and stay all night and fish or do whatever. And then I realized I'd shut my engine off. I didn't have a radio. Nobody knew. You know what? I, I, I became aware right that moment, nobody in the world knows where the hell I am. <laughs> But me, <laughs> that was sobering. Uh, you don't you don't have a starter on your airplane. That one didn't, and uh, no radio, <laughs> no no cell phones. I sure hope I didn't the starts, and it did. But you know uh, that was that was. Uh, a moment for me. Mm -hmm. uh, be careful, you know. Uh, at least uh, be con be conscious of what you're doing and where you're going. And, you know, that that gave me a, a little. I was only 18 by then, mm -hmm. and I began to think. You know, you got to be a little bit careful about life. Got to be just take. You don't have to. My former uh, in-laws used to always say when we we'd, we'd make a trip to their house, be careful, be careful. <laughs> but we used to laugh about it. But it ain't bad. It ain't a bad idea to take to take some precautions about life. So that was sort of that moment. When you were still young and you had that realization that yeah, yeah. maybe you're not immortal, maybe yeah, exactly. Think, you know, uh, uh, it's a. I don't know if anybody can identify with the satisfaction you have in doing something that you always wanted to do. Uh, although I was not paid. For flying, mm -hmm. I was flying. Mm -hmm. It didn't matter, uh, and uh, it, it, to this day, I, I'm I can do something that I wanted to do. Right. Well, uh, you, you know, I think my boxing contributes to that uh, innate desire and ability to to do it something your way, to do it yourself, and be at least capable of doing it, even if you don't do it an outstanding way. I, I can't fly a fighter plane, but hell, I can, get, I can fly a damn pirate cub. <laughs> and yeah. I, I mean, the difference is only speed and maneuverability. So it, I, I hear you say that you were not unhappy while you were, while you were stationed in Alaska. But yet, it seems like you still opted out after your three years to, to leave the Air Force, correct? Yes. Uh, you're a good interviewer. Oh. <laughs> um, because Glenn Smith, my bunkmate, was a preacher, or going to be, he invited me to start coming to a class at the First Baptist Church in Anchorage. It's there now, and I've been to see it since then. The pastor had so many young people, young men, like Clarence, I mean like uh, Glenn, that, he's, that he taught uh, books. Uh, one of them was Spurgeon. Spurgeon is a big name uh, uh, among some Christians, some Christ, uh, some groups. Mm -hmm. Spurgeon was an Englishman, and he he taught. He wrote books designed for preachers who were going to be preachers. 
He taught books like that. I started going to those classes, and I liked what I was hearing. And uh, Glenn never did push me. He 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 said, "You want to go? You want to go to a class today?" Or I don't know what they call it. But yeah, and I go. And all of a sudden, I got serious about it. Before I left Alaska, uh, First Baptist Church provided preachers, young young boys, who who were most of them were in the military. That was their vocation. That was their day job. They were preparing for the ministry for a life. So there were two rescue missions. The uh, uh, what do you call it? Salvation Army, and another rest uh, interdenominational uh, rescue mission. Rescue mission means something in frozen North Alaska. <laughs> and for eating a meal and listening to a sermon, they could get a free meal. Who were the preachers? They were, the preachers were us. I see. So guess what? We did good, and we got experience. And uh, I, they asked me to do a few, and I did a few. I liked it. So I decided that I would go to college, and I'd go to seminary, and that's what it did. Well, there was an, another young man who was, he was not in the service, but he was, he, was, he was in a family in Palmer, Alaska. Uh, what's her name? The lady that... Sarah Palin. Sarah Palin lives... Wasilla. Between uh, Palmer and Anchorage. Wasilla was not a, anything when I was there. All right. Well, at Palmer, this guy, he was a, they, our, our Anchorage church had pastored, had a, a sponsored, had sponsored this mission in uh, Palmer. And this gentleman was uh, taking care of him. And he decided to go back to uh, Texas to go to college and go, and go to seminary. They called on me to take his place. So we were meeting in a home, and while I was there, every, every Sunday, there were four of us who we drove to Palmer, and we conducted services in the morning. We stayed at night until the evening, and then we went back. There. And we, there, one of the guys was a Sunday school teacher. One of them was a music guy. And uh, I forgot what the other one did. And um, we outgrew the home, and we, uh, the carpenter's hall decided that they would let us uh, have Sunday services there, and that's what we did. Well, they ordained me. They they ordained me to the Baptist ministry, and uh, that's what I did. So and I became about, I became an army chaplain. Oh, that's what I was going to ask. So you were about twenty whenever you you did that. Twenty or twenty one went would have been about your three years in, right? I, I was. Uh, uh, I got out when I turned 21, and I got out of the Air Force. Mm -hmm. I was just 21 then. Right. And um, so I must have been about 19. Okay. Uh, I, I, I'll never forget when I was flying, I would be thinking about uh, the guys that I met 
they were great guys. And I thought, uh, I could do that. Uh, and um, there was sort of a, it, it was almost like I was living a, a deciding match. One was pulling this way, one was pulling this way. I, I had already had some material for Spartan University in Tulsa. Uh, I had, there were more flight schools, uh, not flight schools, but aeronautical schools. Uh, there is one that, that exists in uh, uh, Daytona. Um, it's a full, it's a college now. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't think of the name of it, but I knew about all those places. And I was serious about, you know, I used to say, I'm not interested in bus driving, I'm, I'm going to build a bus. Mm -hmm. I consider a pilot a bus driver. I got it, yeah. <laughs> well, so you, it sounds like you shifted and decided you would rather go into the chaplain area. That's sort of what you round in a roundabout way. So it sounds like you went back to OBU, to Oklahoma Baptist mm -hmm. University, and then you followed that with seminary. Um, so help me understand how you got from seminary. So you left you left the Air Force in fifty two, is mm -hmm. that right? Right. Um and then you went back into service in 67? Yes. Okay. Help me understand in how you between? made the, yeah, and how you made that decision to go back in. Well, um the uh the experience of going to college was helpful on that. Um I I knew uh, I, I don't know whether I do, knew this because of my exposure to these young men being a they were planning to do, take that route mm -hmm. all of them mm -hmm. the, the, none, none of I mean there are denominations who consider education you know, you don't want to, you don't want to get educated. There are there are denominations like that. Because I was associating with these young men, I knew college was ahead and seminary was ahead. That's that's seven years. I mean, you can make a dentist in seven years. <laughs> um, that's a big chunk of your life, mm -hmm. and uh, but at the time, I was I was using them, I guess, on what uh, my future plans ought to be. I I have since learned that the denomination I was in there. There are a lot of preachers who don't have a college degree. I've learned that since I became a preacher. At the time, I thought that was a basic requirement, was to go to college and seminary, like it is to become a chaplain. You, nobody can become a chaplain but somebody who is, has four years and two years, four years of college, two years of seminary, and some experience. So, what the army requires was I was going to do, mm -hmm. and um, without any thought of going going as chaplain. That wasn't your goal. Nope. Yeah. In fact, I thought I, I thought you probably are going to get the, you probably know what I'm going to say, but when I was in Alaska. Uh, Chaplains didn't fulfill me. I I couldn't. I couldn't uh, become 
content with just chapel attendance. Uh, and primarily because of the chaplain. The chaplain was, was limited in giving me what I needed. Right. That, I that's what I knew. Yeah. And I, so therefore I didn't think about becoming a mm -hmm. chaplain at that time. Well, when I went in there, uh, when I went to OBU, you, you could take all kinds of uh, courses that were not required. And one of them was the military chaplaincy. Well, to fill out my, you know, your, your, to fill out your, whatever you call it, I filled it up with, I went to, I, I, I took a two-hour course in military chaplaincy. As a part of your requirement that you... Under the yeah. part of the requirement. And, and, and it made me think. I, st I started reassessing the opinion I had about the military chaplaincy in Alaska. Mm -hmm. I started reassessing it. And I, you know, I thought, that wouldn't be a bad life. Because we had visiting army chaplains and military chaplains come and, and tell us things. In your class? In the class. Well, we also had required chapel at OBU. And one time, we had a military chaplain. And I thought, I haven't heard a sermon like that in all my life. He, he really was good. And at the end, he said, if any of you have a slight interest that you might become a chaplain, uh, I invite you to come forward and talk to somebody. Well, I found my way going down there. And that's when it started. My my interest started. I, and I wasn't out of college yet. Mm -hmm. So after that, probably probably the second year at OPU, I started I started thinking about going back into the chaplain because I I'm, I, I I'm no dummy. I realized that experience in what they are doing gives me some kind of advantage. I've been there. Mm -hmm. So I thought, I think I might like it. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that time, I was involved in the uh, uh, Oto Indian Baptist Church. I drove from Shawnee mm -hmm. every weekend to uh, that church. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they didn't. They didn't g give me enough to buy gas to go back. And my mom had. My mom lived in Ponca City, mm -hmm. and I'd say I'd, I'd go back up there and I'd say, "Mom, I need tanky gas." <laughs> but you know, uh, that that wasn't anything to me. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Uh, I finished college and finished, and I went to seminary. Did you go to? Oh, let me ask. Did you go to OBU on the GI Bill then? Yes. That, okay. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Well, that uh, that is about it. Uh, I went to uh, one semester. I went to Northern Oklahoma College, mm -hmm. and I got a I got a certificate, a junior college certificate. That was primarily because I was short of cash and I lived with my mom and used the GI Bill. In fact, I used the GI Bill to buy her groceries. <laughs> and uh, Sounds like a good use to me. That's right. And uh, my mom, uh, everybody loves her mom. And uh, 
I loved her for her uh, common sense. Uh, one time I think I I was showing signs of weariness or something that she picked up on. I might have said I'm going to drop out of school for a little while, you know. I might have said that. But anyhow, and just passing by me in a room one time, she said oh, something I'll never forget. She said, you know, I know uh, she spoke some, uh, uh, a guy's name that I knew out in Bressy, mm -hmm. where our farm was at, okay. side of the Park City. And she said, he finished college. He finished, he, he finished A&M. That's what it was then. And she said, and I asked him how he did it. He said, he told me that you just kept pushing. <laughs> and he didn't give up. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, now I can do that. <laughs> she was giving me some advice. Go mom. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah. You went to seminary, but what made what led you back into um, enlist in the army oh, in the okay. chaplain? Yeah, let's oh, go okay. go there. Um, I I was pastoring a church. Yeah. After seminary. Yeah. In Plains, Kansas. Um. It was a. Uh, it was the only church, Baptist church in town. Of course, there's a little town. Yeah. And uh, while I was there, a gentleman who was in charge of the Oklahoma Baptist Language Missions Project, I guess you would call it. Mm -hmm. uh, That's fine. And. He had under his wing uh, all of the language uh, divided uh, ministries, Indian, Spanish, and there were quite a number of them. Mm -hmm. But by far his largest was were Baptists, and uh, I had I had done that. I had pastor of the Oto Indian Church mm -hmm. while I was in college. And um, I had spoken in many different Indian churches in Oklahoma. They knew me. Mm -hmm. They knew me in Oklahoma. And uh, he knew me, of course. And so while I'm pastoring a non-Indian church, it's also a Northern Baptist church, and I was in the Southern Baptist Convention in Oklahoma. Um, he had gone to Ridgecrest out in, out in New Mexico. Where, uh, it's a summer retreat for the Baptists, okay. or anybody that wants to go there. Yeah. And um, he had been out there, and he. And he had written me a letter. We didn't use telephones like we do now, or computers. And uh, he wrote me a letter. He said, I'm going to be coming back from Ridgecrest your way. Mm -hmm. uh, may I speak to you? May I visit with you? Well, of course he did. Of course he can. His name was Bailey Sewell. Bailey Sewell. He was a... S-E-W-E-L-L -L Sewell. Yep. Yeah. And um, on my front porch, we talked. And um, Charlie, he had a high-pitched voice. Why don't you come back to Oklahoma? I said, uh, well, just to... It, it's amazing... When decisions come, they they come in numbers. Usually, well, life do, doesn't consist of just one thing that you can do. At decision time, it's a number of decisions. But that's the way it's been with me. 
because I had I had had what they call in the ministry a search committee visit. Mm -hmm. And it was from a big church. Uh, the town you won't recognize, but it was a big church. Mm -hmm. Ulysses, Kansas, is perched on the world's largest deposit of natural gas. Mm -hmm. And they don't have anything but rich people in their town. And they had become pastorless. They had just built a four bedroom brick parsonage for the pastor. And they were coming to ask me if I wanted to be their pastor. The search committee always sits on the back row. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you always know what one is there because there are two women and three men, five people. <laughs> So were you tempted to say yes? I had told them that I'd think it over. Mm -hmm. And it, it's amazing that that all happened probably within the same three, week, three weeks. Three weeks. So I had two decisions. I, I could go either way. Mm -hmm. I could stay home. I could go to the Ulysses or I could go back to home, right. back to Oklahoma. Going back to Oklahoma would be a cut in pay mm -hmm. because I would be taking over a church. What he wanted me to do was come back to Oklahoma City and put together two churches that had split from each other mm -hmm. years past. I was to come with one half, half of the equation. The other half was pastorless, but they had a building. Mm -hmm. We had a building, but it wasn't like theirs. It was, they had a great building, ours was poor. Um, my spouse left it up to me. Mm. I knew that she wanted to go to that Ulysses church because better living, mm -hmm. bigger salary, bigger future. I would be in the big church arena. Mm -hmm. Not going there meant I'd be going back. I'd be sliding back. And if you if you assessed it from an economic or a normal human being, mm -hmm. but I I saw it differently. I, I was on the. Board of Directors of the Kansas Baptist Convention. Mm -hmm. uh, they recognized me. They knew I had some skills. In fact, uh, uh, there was a gentleman that we called, in those days we called him our associational missionary. Mm -hmm. He was a preacher whose job it was to look for opportunities to start new churches within his zone. Usually they're elderly. They know things from experience. And when I first got up there, he was building, he was literally building a new, new church. Mm -hmm. And I saw it and I, I thought I need to go help him. So I called him and I said, can you use me? And, oh yeah, so mm -hmm. he was bringing me back home one time, mm -hmm. and uh, he says, Charlie, you're going to go far. And uh, uh, at the time I needed that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anyhow, I knew that I was well thought of in Kansas just having been there so small, literally uh, uh, a short a time. Mm -hmm. And I knew that if I stayed where I was or went to Ulysses, 
I could probably stay in, a, in Kansas all my life. I knew that from a, you know, from an economic point of view. But as for doing what grabbed me, uh, I thought, I thought there's no question about it. I need to go back to Oklahoma City, mm -hmm. and that's what I did. Yeah. And we got the church put together. We got them on uh, self-supporting time. Up to that time, both of them were receiving funds from our home missionary, a home uh, mission board, mm -hmm. and uh, so the, I was a pastor of a growing church. We bought three buildings mm -hmm. around our church for future expansion. Mm -hmm. You can go there now and see the building on it. Um, while I was there, uh, a Lieutenant Colonel Chaplain of the 95th Division called me. Somehow he had heard about the fact that I had been in the service and he just wondered if I was interested in a vacancy that he had in the uh, Army Reserve, the 95th Division in Oklahoma City. And I thought, well that would mean that I'd be a chaplain, but I would still be here. Mm -hmm. I said, sure. He said, I'll send you the application. So were you going to take on two, both the church and the chaplain position? or uh, The chaplain position in a, in a, in a, in a National Guard or a reserve mm -hmm. unit is only for four hours a month or something like that mm -hmm. and two, two weeks out of the year. Mm -hmm. You can do it. They do it all the time. Right. Uh, Non-chaplains do it all the time. Uh, some people spend a career and they retire at 65 with a sizable retirement. I was interested in doing it as a civilian. That's what I would be doing. So I said, yeah. And uh, one day I got a call from Fort uh, Sam Houston and uh, Hey, Chaplain. They called me Chaplain already. And he said, uh, I got your application here. Um, it looks good for you, except for one thing. He said, uh, You're over age. However, he wouldn't have been calling if he didn't have a however. He said, If you want to go on concurrent active duty, we can, we can waive the age limit. How'd you, how'd you like that? How'd you like to go in the Army as a chaplain? I said, give me a five, about five minutes. Uh, we hung up. I talked to my wife. She said, whatever you want to do. And I called her back and I said, we'll do it. That's how it happened. And uh, I went to uh, chaplain school for nine weeks. Nine weeks? Might have been nine weeks. In uh, Fort Hamilton, New York. And uh, went to Fort Sill. Mm -hmm. I gave character guidance in the artillery bowl. Yeah. Where I won a boxing championship. <laughs> That's a good full circle. <laughs> it's a full turn, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, you know, I I I I covered that in the in my uh, character guidance as Army's uh, was the Army's way of making good bo good boys better. And uh, I, I mentioned that to them, and they all just hmm, they didn't say a word. You know, they didn't. It nothing registered. I thought. They're not here for me. <laughs> They're here for. Uh, they always take naps in character guidance. But that's how. 
That's how I got in the Army. And that was 67? 67. Okay. And I went to Vietnam. And uh, let me tell you, it, you know, somebody's going to get real bored with this presentation, I'm afraid. But uh, uh, I went. I went to Vietnam. There, in that, in that uh, enlistment opportunity, there was another guy involved because he had two vacancies. And guess what? He was over age. Mm -hmm. And he also went to Vietnam. His name was Jack Park. He was a pastor in Oklahoma City. And we, we became great friends. Um, I got we both got our orders about the same time, and I got word that my mother had cancer, and the doctor said uh, it it looks terminal. I suggest that you uh, get a deferment. Mm -hmm. So I did. Jack went on to Vietnam, and I was deferred till October. She passed away in June, and um, so when I got to Vietnam, um, you you stay in a BOQ, Bachelor Officer's Quarters, for your first night. And uh, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a country where people are killing the people. And uh, I didn't know a soul except Jack Park. I didn't know where Jack Park was. It turned out that he was that he was assigned assigned to the same base that I was assigned to. We, we'd see each other. Well, I didn't know that the first night. And uh, they turned the lights out on all of us officers. It didn't matter, you know, turn the lights out and start. And uh, I heard this familiar voice. I'm looking for a no good army, Indian army chaplain. Where the hell is Charles Leclerc? And it was, it was Jack Park. And I crawled out of bed and met him. And uh, then the next day, I was assigned uh, to a chapel about a mile and a half from him. Mm -hmm. It's on the same army base. And uh, the army, the army uh, assigns chaplains and doctors together in a war zone. So my my roommate. Uh, was the battalion doctor and I was the battalion chaplain and uh, uh, at the time uh, uh, I forgot I forgot what I was going to say I'm sorry no, I've had okay. a stroke uh, you're, you're doing great okay um, you were talking about being stationed, being assigned to a room with a battalion doctor, and you were the battalion chaplain. Okay. So, uh, there was. I don't know what was the rationale behind that. Like, why? Why did they station you with a doctor? Because we're non-combatants. Okay. Um, and I got a story about that. Okay. Um, my my first my first doctor. Uh, was he had hair all over him he had hair on his front and back and he he is a happy guy when he wakes up uh -huh. he gets up before you do he starts singing uh, I can't I, 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 I want to give you a mental picture 
of these quarters. Okay, the dock is on this, it's a building shaped like an L. Okay, two, two stories. Okay, on this wing, or this is a wing of the main part. The commanding officer is above me. I'm, in the, I'm on this corps. He, the commanding officer, a lieutenant colonel, a lieutenant colonel, is upstairs. His deputy, a major, is over Doc, because Doc's on this side of the room. The rooms don't have a wall between them, but you have foot lockers, I mean uh, wall lockers, turned front and back. So you have a little bit of privacy. So we have some privacy. You have the width of the lockers, uh, metal lockers. So that's the wall that exists between you. That you have a common dresser with a mirror sitting against that wall. And you have a bunk. And you have no, you have no window panes. You have a screen. But, but there's also an overhang outside on both sides that keep the rain from hitting the side of the building. But there, in Vietnam, there's no cold weather. In, in, in uh, Long Bend, where we were, uh, it, it's hot all the time. It's either wet and hot or cold or uh, uh, dry and hot. And uh, when it's dry, it's dry. <coughs> there's no rain at all. So that's the way we were situated. And uh, you had a common uh, john mm -hmm. where you went to uh, shave and everything. Uh, I'd always get up late and I'd hear Doc sing. But you had to get up because you couldn't sleep anymore. Mm -hmm. you know? But I got to tell you a story about non combatants. I, I had grown up shooting rabbits, skunks, and, you know, a farm boy. You, you, uh, you, you just learn how to shoot a gun. And you don't learn how, you just do it. <laughs> and, uh, okay. So, John Mayer, Dr. John Mayer, he's always making little jokes of some kind. So, but, but with a deadpan look. And uh, he noticed that I always carried my assistant. Every chaplain has an assistant, an enlisted guy who does mm -hmm. his driving. He's more or less a bodyguard. And um, I'd always carry his M16 because I knew how to use it. Doc and I used to go to the range every Sunday afternoon practice. Mm -hmm. So I had the I had the M sixteen between my legs and uh Doc would see us. We'd go we're going out and move out in the booties. I, as we go out the gate I show up I I, uh, I show the M sixteen with the clip in. Mm -hmm. When you come back in the gate you show it out. Anybody can see me, see it that I'm, 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 I'm armed, because he's driving. So, when it, it, this this is the sequence or the, the little story. Uh, my assistant is there, and one of his aides is there, in this little conversation. And and old Doc picked it just like that. He he picked to mention what he was going to talk about, just so the group was just right for him telling the story. Mm -hmm. He said, "Charlie, I noticed that you carry your assistance M16 with you when you go out in the boonies." Yeah, I do. Well, they told us at Fort Sam Houston. 
that doctors and chaplains are incompetents and they shouldn't be carrying any firearms. My, my assistant piped up. He says, Doc, I think you mean in, uh, a non-combatants, don't you? No, they said that, in, that chaplains and doctors were incompetents and they can't carry guns. <laughs> you know what? I, I wrote that story about being the chaplain in Vietnam. I wish I'd dropped the magazine, but it's a, it's a, it's a MOA, a MOA magazine, M-O-W-W, -W, uh, Military Order of World Wars. About three, three years ago, they asked me to, to contribute uh, something about being in Vietnam, and I wrote that. I, I included that in that story about Doc, about Doc uh, saying that we were incompetents. I like that. <laughs> I'll make a note of that too, that there's an article to look up. Um, um, well, I, I, um, I think we're getting the close to close to the end of the time that we have. All right. Um, which is unfortunate because I know that there's <laughs> a lot more that we can talk about. Yeah. Um, but I wonder if there's any sort of parting bit that you want to mention that you didn't get the chance yet, um, either about sort of the rest of the time, you know, what your function was in Vietnam or, um, you know, any sort of parting lessons since your long life since you've been back. Um, well, um... The, uh, it was my, uh, I don't think it was a hope, but it certainly, certainly was my intention when I, when I got in the Army was to make it a career. Mm -hmm. uh, when the Jeep accident occurred, mm -hmm. um, Doc, my other Doc, saw to it that I didn't, uh, I wasn't taken to Japan or to Tokyo and got repaired and then returned to Vietnam for another tour. Uh, because he said that would happen if we sent you to, to Tokyo. He said it, it happens to doctors, it happens to everybody. So he treated me uh, uh, in my quarters the last month and a half or so. So what was your accident? We were I, we were going out to a uh, detachment of ours where they had had a casualty mm -hmm. and we were going out there to do a uh, memorial service to him and my assistant was driving uh, as he always did and Oh, we were we were we were coming uh, down a uh, a bridge that engine we were an engineer group construction engineer outfit it was 46 engineer battalion okay and uh, we I was going out there to perform to perform a memorial service to the gentleman that they lost. And as we came up, it was a steep hill. We'd go down like that so abruptly. As we came down, we saw traffic coming across a one-way bridge that the engineers had built. And um, so we stopped. And my assistant turned to me and he said, it'll be about like one of those Arvins to run in a big truck into us. Because he'd come over the hill and not see us. He, he didn't have time to stop. And it happened. And the brake was set, the Jeep was thrust forward about 50 feet. My assistant almost bent the steering wheel double. That little gas can on the back of the Jeep lost its lid and gas went up in the air and it came, we felt it coming down. I knew immediately it was gas. I'd been knocked out. I, I'm knocked, not knocked out, but knocked out of the Jeep. 
and I was sitting on the ground. And I don't know how I got there. I, did, I don't remember any of that. I guess I was out just a moment. When I was aware of anything, it was my assistant saying, are you all right? Mm -hmm. And he pulled me up in the upright position. Mm -hmm. And here comes the driver speaking in Vietnamese, worrying about what to do with the damage to our vehicle. And I said, don't worry about it. Our motor pool will take care of it. Get, you didn't stop. You were targets if you stopped on any kind of road. Mm -hmm. We got to get out of here. The road's clear. So we left, and uh, that's how it happened. And uh, the, uh, for, the, for the moment, for the day, my commanding officer saw something was wrong with me because I couldn't get out of the Jeep. My, my, I was locked in the seated position, to put it yeah. easily. And uh, he said, give me your Bible. He was also a Southern Baptist, and he said, I can do this. He was a lieutenant colonel, and I didn't want him to do it. And I said, no, I'll do it if you can get me up in a standing position. Because I was too, I had to raise, I had to do it slowly, but I was able to stand up. And um, he sent me back on his chopper to the Medivac, 24th Evac Hospital. And um, my doctor was waiting for him. And they took me in and x-rayed me and made all kinds of uh, calculations. And, and they decided that uh, I needed to have surgery. Mm -hmm. And immediately, Doc checked me out. He said, you're going to go back to your bug, and if you stay uh, if you stay laid down the whole tour, you're going to stay here. You're going to stay right here in this BOQ if if you can't move. Mm -hmm. And uh, he didn't want them to send me to Tokyo and come back and serve another tour. Right. And he made me promise that I'd check into the next uh, when I got oh, when I left when when I came back home. And I got my new assignment that I would uh, check in with the medics at my next place. And that's what I did. And uh, I eventually uh, got a uh, disability retirement. Uh, yeah. And here's what I want to end with. Yes. If I had known in advance of going to Vietnam, although I wanted and intended to stay in the Army for retirement, for regular retirement, if I had known before I went in that I would do it, that my Army career would end somewhere in Fort Jackson, South Carolina, 1972, if I knew all that in advance, I'd still go to college, go to seminary. I'd still go to chaplain school, whatever they wanted me to do, I'd still go to Vietnam. If I, if I knew all that in advance, the uh, experience of being an army chaplain to guys who couldn't guarantee that they'd be home back from any kind of duty they had every day, uh, I'd still do it. Mm. No regrets then, sounds like. Or not for your career, maybe. Your career path. Well, I think it's... um. It's obviously a long way from, from where you started with the company C <laughs> to where you to where you ended up in a chaplain's role in Vietnam. It is. Um, I, as I'm listening to, I'm thinking that 
when you first joined, you're on the tail of World War II was ending. I mean, it was a recent end. Mm -hmm. Korea was looming. When you started your military service, there were rumblings of right. Korea. Mm -hmm. um, but yet you still chose to go back in a, in a, what can only really, I think, be described as more of a nurturing role to help people get through yeah. combat. That's in, what I meant. In Vietnam. That's, that's what, I mean, they didn't even need to pay, pay me a salary. <laughs> yeah. It did, just pay me to live and do what I was doing. Yeah. Uh, I, I couldn't get used to the fact that I didn't have to beat the bushes to get attendance. They were that they they filled the chapel every time I was there. My favorite place to go was the rock quarry. We had a it was not a full company, but they had a young captain there. And they created all of the uh, gravel that construction engineers. We built miles of roads over there. We built schools. We built uh, city halls for the country that they never had before. We built more than we tore down. And, and you needed materials to do it. So the rock car provided the hard gravel rock. They they even had native rock like this place has, has here. So why was it but your favorite place to go? I'll tell you. <laughs> um, those guys, uh, Benoit Air, Air Base mm -hmm. is where they were. Air Force place. Mm -hmm. F-4s took off all day long. And they were, here's the run. well the runway, you could see a runway. They were off to the left end of one of, of they had two runways. But they were, they were situated, where they were situated was the rock. Mm -hmm. And they were there because the rock was there. They had explosions going off every day, blowing rock up so they could scoop it out. Their young captain was a comedian. He, was, he, he had something wise to say every time he saw it. Mm -hmm. And when we had chapel, they closed down everything. We assembled in the mess hall. Everybody in the company was there. Every soul was, here we are, chap. And uh, I, it, I thought I was going to tell you, but I can hardly tell you. They, they were so interested mm -hmm. in what I was bringing to them. They would ask questions in the middle of my talking. I've never experienced that before. That's and th they were, they were eager listeners. Mm -hmm. One time, it was it was Christmas Eve, and I I had I had a pedal pushed organ. And my my major executive, executive officer, the he he is he is second in command of them, and he told me, Charlie, if you need somebody to play uh, your organ in the chapel, I'll play it. I said, Are you organ player? He said, No, but I'll tell you what. If you'll send me the if you'll pick that your hymns a week ahead, I'll go down there every day and practice. Because he could play the piano, mm -hmm. so he he, uh, and so I took him out there on on uh, Christmas Eve, and he's sitting there. I've got a tape recorder somewhere oh, of, yeah. of this evening. Yeah. And he's sitting there peddling, and occasionally he hits a sour note, 
but he's also singing. Joy to the world. And all those soldiers are singing joy to the world. I mean, it is hilarious. None of them could carry it to <laughs> I almost laughed in their faces. It, it, it was a, for that reason, it was, it, I loved them, maybe. Because I, nobody in my life have had, I, I ever have had 100% attendance. I mean, you, 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 you usually have to fight for people to come to church, you know. And these guys have welcomed me. Yeah. Well, during one of those night services, this, this was not on Christmas Eve, but it, it was a, a night service that I had for them. We had a rocket attack. And that broke us up. We had to run for cover. Mm -hmm. But those guys, maybe I, they were my favorites because of all the people that I ministered to, these guys were under the most constant threat because they were at their end of the runway and they got your daily rockets at not them, but the airplanes. And uh, we never lost anybody while I was there. And, but that didn't, that didn't do anything for the fact that they were the most exposed because those rockets often fell short mm -hmm. and all they had to do was let one fall short and it'd be all, that'd all be gone. Yeah. Uh, I understand, yeah, I understand. Maybe they were, uh, maybe I favored them because they were in most danger. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I can, I can see your, um, I can see that that would be a good feeling to have such camaraderie within, yeah. With you your, know, with one your I have, a, I, I have a lot of pictures. Yeah. But um, I have a picture. This, this is a captain in the U.S. Army. Understand? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. We had banana trees all mm -hmm. over the place. So, I'm. I'm trying to recall his name but I can't. That's okay. Um, but he's he, he wearing a hard hat. It's aluminum. Mm -hmm. Aluminum. Of course he's in a khaki, I mean a, a fatigue uniform. And he's he's visiting the doc who has a clinic in the comp in the battalion compound. Mm -hmm. That's the headquarters. Buildings all around. There are two banana trees in front of Doc's uh, uh, medical clinic. And uh, the picture I have is this captain, company commander of a rock quarry. <laughs> there, the banana tree is behind him, and he's acting like a monkey. <laughs> he's looking like a monkey. <laughs> His hard hat right here. And, uh, um, if that ain't a picture of him, I I, I can't I, I I can't tell you what he looks like, but that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you why I think this is the most fitting place to end because we didn't get this on the recording, but I'm gonna summarize. The first thing that you said to me when you came in here today was that we don't take this seriously. Like it's serious business. Yeah. But we find our way to laugh. We find the way to find humor. It's who yeah. we are. Um, speaking specifically about your Shalako folks and the, but Native American veterans in general. That's right. Mm -hmm. So I think it's probably most fitting that we end on a really humorous. <laughs> I <note>. agree. <laughs> okay. I agree with you. Um, I yeah. Uh, we can in, we can in, uh, we we can induct him into the Ponca tribe, maybe. <laughs> That's right. <laughs>